Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading to Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. And so we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. season, we open all the dark places in our lives and the memory of the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you that we may walk in the light of Christ. See, I'm not Brother George, <laughs> but for our announcement for this morning, we have um, let's see, we have the Awanas. They're still looking for people that need to volunteer, and if you'd like to help them, then you can always talk to Mr. George or Miss Trudy Buckman. There's also the live nativity, which will be on the 12th and the 13th at 5:30 of this upcoming month. And if you want to take part, you can join either the praise team, or if you know somebody, they can join the children's choir. Um, we also have the flower list, which has been updated. And if you want to sign up for it, you may do that. We have community service hours for any 9th through 12th graders. So see Miss Melinda if you want to do that. And we also have Christmas assistance. So if you need anyone who uh, needed assistance this year, you can also ask Miss Melinda about that. And uh, we also have the Christmas tree lighting coming up. And it has been shifted not tonight because of the rain, but to tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. And we have Miss Ms. Bryan, who has more to say on that. Amen. 
five eighty one. We're going to sing we have to sing all four verses of We Have Heard the Joyful Sound. <laughs> Shine your light to the world. I will glorify your 
our special guest speaker, Reverend Andy DeGuire. Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. And, uh, as we begin this morning, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue in our worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you came to find us. That is what this season reminds us about, Lord, that you came. You left the glories of heaven to come find us, Lord, to live a a broken life here among us, Lord, to be rejected and ultimately suffer and pay the price for our waywardness. Lord, we thank you and we praise you today. You are worthy of our praise, worthy of our glory and honor. The kingdom is yours now and forever. Lord, we pray and ask that you would help us to be on mission with you as we listen to the lyrics of this song, to be the carrier of the hope a living hope that you offer, you alone. We thank you, we praise you. I ask and pray, Lord, that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit to faithfully share the truth of your word and that you would do what you do in the hearts of your people to cause them to obey and respond. In Jesus' name, amen. I felt like a modern-day leper. Hundreds of miles away from home, Hurting and contagious, I had to live isolated on the top of a mountain. (laughs) It was the summer of 2017, and our student pastor at Living Truth at the time had invited me to drive the kids to Student Life Youth Camp that summer at Covenant College. And at the time, I had two boys in the high school ministry. We were going to be at rec camps. It was going to be a week of fun. I was going to have the opportunity to lead Bible study discussions with the kids. All that on top of beautiful Lookout Mountain, Georgia. I mean, for me, it was a no-brainer. Definitely wanted to go participate. And all the last-minute preparations were coming together just fine. Well, except for what happened a few days prior. See, I'd come down with a fever. wasn't feeling too good, but the fever passed about as quick as it came, and I didn't think anything about it as we picked up the rental vehicles the day before we left for the trip. But that early morning when we got up the next day, I looked at my hands and I could have sworn they looked a little splotchy. So I showed them to my wife. I said, "Ah, what what do you think about this? She could barely notice anything. I felt fine. Besides, what was I going to do now? They were depending on me to drive. So I said, ah, no worries. So me and the boys headed out the door. And all was fine, all the way up the ride to camp. But as we were checking in, to my shock, I looked down, I saw that my palms had broken out in an angry red rash. And I quickly put my hands in my pocket. I was embarrassed. I didn't want anybody to see what was going on. And so I quickly excused myself to the restroom, and I started looking at my hands, and my, my hands were hurting, and my feet were hurting. And I thought, what's going on? I looked at my arms. They were splotchy. I thought, did I eat something that didn't agree with me? Or am I allergic to something? I couldn't think of anything. And then all of a sudden, it came to me. Recently, I had been exposed to someone in our church who had hand, foot, mouth disease. Hand, foot, mouth? I thought that was something only babies got. Infants, right? And here I am, breaking out in hand, foot, mouth. I couldn't believe this. I was supposed to be a driver for this group. I was supposed to help these kids this week. There was no way I could leave. I was supposed to lead them in these breakout sessions. Well, guess what? I had broken out. (laughs) That entire week, I felt like an outcast. I had to move down the hill to a dorm away from everyone else. I had to wear a long sleeve jacket because I was so embarrassed while going over the kids' Bible study lessons. I didn't get to participate in any recreation at all that week, and I had to worship, sit, and eat alone away from everyone else. I hurt, (laughs) but it hurt to be there and feel 
isolated like a leper from your own church youth group. Well, a couple weeks ago, I was sharing this painful story with some friends, and they were, they were sympathetic to a degree, right? But then all of a sudden, the jokes started to fly, right? And all of a sudden, the, the painful uh, emotions of that wound were kind of opened up again, and I thought, man, come on, how about a little compassion here? That was a difficult time. I really wish I could have offered them some sensitivity training <laughs> in that moment. Well, in the workplace, sensitivity training focuses on making employees aware of others' attitudes and behaviors and their feelings. And as important as it is to learn to be respectful and tolerant of other people's preferences and their uh, opinions, I believe there's another important layer of sensitivity that we may have left out. Spiritual sensitivity. Spiritual sensitivity focuses on discerning a person's receptivity to spiritual things. Since a person's spirit is going to live forever in either one of two places, heaven or hell, I believe it's important that we learn how to live with spiritual sensitivity to others. But how do we do that? We can't just walk around with a thermometer to take people's spiritual temperature. No. But what we can do is learn to recognize certain cues in other people's attitudes and behaviors. And in this message entitled Sensitivity Training, in today we're going to look in our text to see how Jesus lived with spiritual sensitivity to those people around him. This morning I'm going to give you the freedom to draw in church. Okay, I brought my little doodle board, right? So if it gets slow, I'm going to give you a couple practical uh, ways that you can remember the things that we talk about today. And I'm going to share with you three significant reasons why it's critical as followers of Jesus that we learn to live with spiritual sensitivity to lost people around us. This morning our text comes from Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10. So if you have a Bible, turn there, Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. The scripture says, he, that is Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. He said, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's going to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of all my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give it back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today, today, salvation has come to this house, for he too is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. The first reason that we should live with spiritual sensitivity is that seekers are all around us, empty, isolated, and searching for hope if we'll be aware the greater context within Luke here is that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem he knew the cross was coming and so he was merely intending to pass through Jericho and in verse 2 Luke introduces us to this interesting character Zacchaeus the scripture calls him a chief tax collector now the Jews had nothing but hatred for their fellow Jewish tax collectors because in addition to collecting taxes for Rome, they often line their pockets with riches for themselves. They were considered traitors, liars, cheats, disloyal to their own people. And not only this, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. He was the head of this ring. But there was a hole in this man's heart. 
something that all the titles and all the money could not fill. He was curious. He needed a change. And so he was empty, <clears throat> searching for something more. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was a wee little man, Jesus, they would, the crowd would not let him see Jesus. So he was determined. And he ran on ahead to the place where he knew Jesus was going to go. And he climbed up that sycamore tree. Now think for a minute how undignified it must have looked to see this polished and public official shimmying up the sycamore tree, right? But Zacchaeus didn't care. You see, his soul was empty. He was desperate. Have you ever felt so desperate that you really didn't care what other people thought? Sometimes we in the church forget how empty and how broken people outside the church feel. The physical experience of being lost can be quite scary. And you think back to a time when maybe you were lost physically. I was lost in the dark on a mountain. Go back with me to that Covenant College trip in 2017 with a hand, foot, mouth. And our activities were over for the day. It was about 10 p.m. at night. And my hands and my feet were hurting. I mean, they were hurting. I needed some relief. And so my friend Google told me that there was a Walmart down at the bottom of the mountain. And I also knew that the college closed its gates at midnight. So I had a brief two-hour window that I could try and venture down, find some relief down at the bottom of the mountain, and come back. So I grabbed my cell phone. I happened to notice it was kind of low on power. That was not wise. But I grabbed it and hobbled down the hill to my car. I got in the car, and I started heading down. And I had to go through a couple neighborhoods. You, but it was pitch black, mind you. I've never driven through this area at all. And so I'm proceeding rather cautiously. And you know what's in neighborhoods? Stop signs and streets and other road signs, if you're looking for them, right? Well, I was feeling pretty good, armed with a sense of a good, a good sense of direction. And so I went through the first stop four-way stop, and I was like, okay, that's good, but when I hit the second and the third and was turning this way for one and that way for the other, all of a sudden I start, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I should have been leaving a trail of red crumbs behind me because I didn't know if I was going to be able to find my way back. So I'm driving down this mountain, and have you ever noticed that if you've ever driven through the mountains, it's not like driving around here, right? I mean, you, you can't drive 70 miles an hour down the side of a mountain, right? I guess you could do that once, but it wouldn't work out too well for you, right? So we, I wind my way down around the contours of this mountain, and I get down to the bottom. Now it's about 1030, okay? And where Siri tells me to go on my phone, now there's a detour that wasn't showing up. So I'm like, oh, great. Now what am I going to do, right? So I burn about another 30 minutes trying to go as far as it goes, and it just reroutes me. I'm in this vicious loop. I'm like, oh, no. Time is getting away from me. Now it's about 11 o'clock. And I'm starting to really get stressed out. And I'm not even to the Walmart yet. And so finally, I'm in this rough part of town. And I'm thinking, i got to do something. So I go through Wendy's drive through at 11 something at night. Not for a Frosty, but to get directions. And so I asked the lady, I said, ma'am, please, I'm, I need to get to a Walmart. And she said, oh, yeah, sure. There's one around the other side of the, the mountain about 10 to 15 minutes from here. I'm like, okay, thanks a lot. So I speed across town. I can do that now because I'm at the bottom. And I get to the other, I get to the Walmart, hobble my way into the uh, pharmacy, pharmacy section, looking for it, finally find hydrocortisone, get what I need, check out, hobble back to my car, in the car. Now it's 1130. I've only got 30 minutes to get back up the hill. So I start going, right? Making my way, I'm doing fine, feeling good until I get to those neighborhoods again. And the stop signs, and I'm like, I don't recognize anything that looks familiar, right? 
And I looked down at my phone. It's less than 10% now. I'm thinking, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. And then my wife calls. She calls the kid. She's a loving wife. So she called to check on me. Honey, how you doing? Did you make it down there? Okay. So now I'm trying to manage a phone call, find my way in the dark. Everything's unfamiliar. I'm thinking, I'm not going to make this back. And as I'm talking with her, all of a sudden it dies. I mean, my phone died. Now it's the blind leading the blind. So I just make a decision, turn left, and I go down this one road, and nothing is looking familiar at all. And I think, <laughs> they're going to find me on the side of the road. And the next morning, right, I'll sleep in my car. I see a gentleman, he's bringing out his trash to the side of the road so late at night. I thought, I had to, just for a brief moment, I thought, you know what, I'll just go back and knock on that guy's door and see if he'll give me directions. And I thought, and I thought that is stupid. I'm going to get shot if I do that. You know, it's almost midnight. And so nothing's looking familiar. I decided I'm just going to turn around and go back and see if I can find something. So I am praying, folks. I am praying in desperation, Lord, please show me a sign. And then finally, would you believe it? Oh, it was like something that opened up from the heavens, right? There must have been some kind of branch or something literally over a sign, I kid you not, that was pointing to Covenant College up the road. I could not believe it. And so I made the sign, drove all the way back in, made it in just in the nick of time. And I share that story with you to, to help you understand that sense of desperation, that sense of urgency when, when you're lost and you're alone and you're isolated. And that's how so many people in our community feel. I want to share with you this morning just some brief uh, facts for us to consider about where we are in terms of lostness. The brutal facts of lostness in Santa Rosa County, all right, we we would probably consider ourselves the Bible Belt or buckle of the Bible Belt, right? There are 184,000 people that live in Santa Rosa County. That's based on uh, 2019 statistics. 184,000 from Jay, Verdale, all the way up down to Navarre and Gulf Breeze. But according to bestplaces.net, 55% of people who live in our county claim no religion whatsoever. That's over half. And then we know that not everyone who is religious is born again, right? And so if we only count evangelical churches in Santa Rosa County, then Santa Rosa County has almost 121,000 lost people. That's staggering. 121,000 here. I share that with us to say lost people are all around us, right? They live on our street. They work at our office. They play in your foursome or they, they go to your hunting camp or they work out with you at CrossFit or they teach down the hall from you at school. But you and I, we can't reach them all by ourselves, amen? And so... This morning, I want to give you a simple tool that you can use to begin to identify the lost in your spheres of relationships. So what I'm going to do is <clears throat> draw some concentric circles, right? So uh, concentric meaning just that they are ever expanding around, right? And in the very center of this circle, I would put my name, you would put your name. And then in every layer of expanding circles exists a different kind of relationship you have. So the first one I would put my family relationships. The second would be uh, my friends. The next one would be representing um, all the people that I do my hobbies or um, things that I enjoy with. And then finally, might be my neighbors or my coworkers or even person X at the grocery store that you run into, right? And what you would do in this concentric circle, uh, this diagram of these concentric circles, is you would identify who are all the people in your family, your neighbors, your friends, etc. 
and you want to find out. You're going to ask yourself, does this person know Christ? Does this person know Christ? And once you begin to identify who they are, then you can begin to pray for them by name and begin to prayerfully think about what are some ways that I can engage them with the gospel. Now, to be clear, not all lost people are seekers. Some, like Zacchaeus, are empty, they're isolated, and they're searching for hope. So how do we identify a seeker from a lost person? Well, more on that in just a minute, but a more pointed question this morning is, how do we treat lost people in our community? Do we shun and condemn them like Zacchaeus? Or do we welcome and receive them like Jesus? The second reason we should live with spiritual sensitivity to seekers around us is that Jesus lived with spiritual sensitivity to lost people around him. And followers of Jesus should do what Jesus did. Amen? So let's notice what he did. First, we know that Jesus was passing through. He was around people. He went to where they were. You know, he didn't always stay in the temple and expect people to come to him. Jesus had a ministry of going. And as he was going to where people were, in this particular instance, he stopped to see God's activity. He noticed Zacchaeus up in a tree. Now, here's an important question. How did Jesus recognize that God was at work in Zacchaeus when there was a whole crowd of people around him? Jesus knew that there is no one who is righteous. There's no one who seeks after God on their own. Everyone has turned aside from seeking after God. But he also taught that no one could come to him unless the Father drew that person to Jesus. So anyone seeking out Jesus got his spiritual attention. And that is what it means to live with spiritual sensitivity. All right? All right, I'm going to draw you another picture. <clears throat> so imagine, if you will, it's kind of like a school of fish, right? Swimming in one direction. Don't you love my fish? Right here. Got some big fish, got some little fish, right? And they're all swimming. They're a school of fish. They're swimming in one direction. But all of a sudden, imagine you got another fish that's swimming the opposite way, right? Against the flow. That's what it means to see a person who is seeking God. You see, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We move away from God, naturally. But anytime you have someone being drawn to Jesus or God or the Bible or they're asking spiritual questions, that's not natural. That's supernatural. So among the whole crowd, only Zacchaeus took extreme measures to seek out Jesus. And notice what the Lord did next. Number one, and these are not incredibly profound, but they are in another way. Jesus stopped. He stopped. He didn't ignore the man up in the tree, right? He didn't make fun of him. Hey, look at that goofy guy up in the tree, you guys. Let's laugh at him. No. He stopped. And then secondly, he spoke to him. He spoke to him. You know, he acknowledged his presence. And what did he say? The very first thing he said was Zacchaeus. The Lord knew his name. And you know what? Whether you're watching us online today or you're here today, maybe you're feeling forgotten or isolated or just going through a rough patch, I want you to be reminded this morning, no matter what you're going through, Jesus knows your name. Third, Jesus spent time with him up close. Jesus the Son of God, who was passing through Jericho on his way to die for the sins of the whole world, suddenly paused and decided to spend the day with Zacchaeus. Wow. To host a great and important rabbi such as Jesus in your home was a great honor. Hosts would take responsibility to feed their guests and provide lodging for them on their way through. And meals and lodging were a sign of friendship. 
and honor to guests. And Jesus' offer to stay with Zacchaeus honored him publicly. But notice in the text that not everyone else was happy about that. Jesus became unpopular with the crowd for the way he treated outsiders. And when you care for seekers, you too may be criticized or misunderstood. But Jesus demonstrated compassion, not condemnation, to them. You know, when I had hand, foot, mouth disease at youth camp, I was embarrassed. I walked around with my hands in my pocket a lot that week. I didn't want anyone to know I was embarrassed. But you know, students aren't dumb. They had to know something was up. Here's this old guy. He's wearing a long sleeve jacket, and it's 95 degrees outside. What's going on? In the same way, when you and I become aware of our sin, we become self-conscious, don't we? We feel embarrassed or ashamed. It's not something that we want people to look at us or see us. Let me tell you, that week was hard. You see, because I couldn't even, I couldn't even touch what other people were touching because I was contagious. And that made it difficult to do certain very important daily functions. One of them was eating. You see, because we ate in a cafeteria. And so I had to do something very humbly. I had to ask for help. And so I called my two boys over to me and I told them, I showed them what was going on with me and I said, guys, I can't even dip my own plate. Could you help me? And they did. They were glad to do it. And after they served my plate, I, I went to go sit and eat by myself. But I was so grateful for their act of compassion and grace. As followers of Jesus, we must follow Jesus on mission to seek and save the lost and minister to them the way he did with compassion. We must first go to them. Now that we recognize that people who are seeking out Jesus are seekers, ask yourself, am I waiting for them to come to church or Sunday school? Or am I going out to them to where they live, work, and play? We must acknowledge them, right? Do we truly notice lost people? Or do we neglect them because they're not like us? And third, we must get to know them. Do we go the extra mile? to invite them to coffee or to our house or to buy them a sandwich or ask about their needs and invite them into our homes for a meal. As followers of Jesus, we must do what he did. Minister to seekers with grace and compassion. The third reason we should live with spiritual sensitivity is because seekers really can be changed by the power of the gospel. Do you believe that this morning? Are any Christians in the room? Come on, people, right? Seekers really can be changed by the power of the gospel. The gospel changed Zacchaeus. Notice, Zacchaeus received Jesus rejoicing. Think about it. A couple minutes ago, he was being stiff-armed by all the people in community. And then all of a sudden, when the Lord welcomed and received him, he came down rejoicing. The gospel changed his mood. <clears throat> Secondly, excuse me, Zacchaeus changed his mind, repenting. Where Zacchaeus was once self-absorbed, now he had a concern for the poor. And where he had cheated people before, he told the Lord that he would repay those people four times. Folks, that kind of complete reversal of values and thinking is nothing less than than what the Bible calls repentance. And repentance, the Bible says, there's no salvation without repentance. The gospel transformed Zacchaeus' mind. But then also notice that Zacchaeus demonstrated faith obeying. Now remember, they're still out in public, and Jesus kind of stops, or I'm sorry, Zacchaeus stops Jesus there and says, wait, Lord, hold on. I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor and anyone I've cheated four times. 
Don't you know the people in that town, they started lining up saying, okay, we first, right? They were probably lining up. But there was no way Zacchaeus could have gotten out of that commitment. He made it publicly. He stated the obvious, right? And that's the point of Jesus' word in verse 9. He said, today, salvation has come to this house. What did he mean by that? Well, Jesus affirmed that something supernatural had already happened in Zacchaeus before he'd given the first thing away. It's a good reminder for us that salvation is a gift to be received, not an award to be earned. And he, too, was a son of Abraham. What did that mean? Well, to the Jews, Abraham was the father of their faith. But Abraham demonstrated faith like when God called him to offer his son Isaac up as a sacrifice. And in a similar way, Zacchaeus' faith was on public display as well. Because of his public commitment to care for the poor and pay back those he'd wronged, Jesus affirmed that Zacchaeus' faith was true. <clears throat> the gospel transformed his behavior. There is power in the gospel. The gospel changed the Apostle Paul. In Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And that meant something coming from Paul because formerly he was Saul, the greatest antagonist and persecutor of the early church. Seekers really can be changed by the power of the gospel. Amen? But what is the gospel? The gospel literally means good news. The good news of the gospel is this, that God has made a way for you and I to be rescued out of our brokenness and our condemnation to be restored back to God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to take out my whiteboard again and share with you one simple way that I've learned how to share the gospel with people. That I, if you don't have a, a way that you typically do, this is a, a great one. It's called the three circles. And in this first circle over here, it looks kind of cracked. It represents the broken world that we live in. I don't think I need to go on uh, belaboring that point, that we live in a broken, messed up world, right? But in this first circle over here, with a heart in it, it represents the perfect world that God made in the beginning, where there was no sin, there was no disease or pandemic, there was no suffering or death. That was never God's plan. So how did we get from here to here? Well, the reality is that whenever we choose to walk away from God's perfect design, it always takes us to a place of brokenness, right? And I don't know about you, but brokenness hurts. I don't like feeling broken, and I bet you don't either. When we go to the store, we don't buy broken stuff, right? Nobody likes brokenness. And so we do all kinds of things to try and escape from our brokenness. Sometimes it might be to pursue a, a career, of, of, to be successful with money, power, or fortune, or fame. Sometimes it might be we think we can escape our brokenness by finding that perfect relationship with, a, with another man or a woman. Okay? Sometimes we might even get a little bit religious and think that we need to go to church and, and do things on our own that we think could please God. And for some people, the pain of brokenness is so much that they even self-medicate with drugs or alcohol to escape the pain this life and brokenness leads us in. But the reality is, folks, we cannot escape our own brokenness, no matter how hard we try. Like a bungee cord that stretches so far out and snaps back, we are powerless to escape brokenness on our own. And left in that state, we are separated from God forever. But the good news of the gospel lies in the third circle, which represents Christ and the gospel. That God sent his one and only son, Jesus, down to earth 
And he lived a perfect life. Jesus never sinned, not once. And he proved his perfect love for you and for me when he died in my place and in yours for the sins that we've committed. And he suffered that death. And on the third day, according to God's perfect design, he was raised again to prove that God had forgiven us. And so by doing that, Jesus kind of gives us a escape door out of brokenness, right? And so if we are willing to humble our hearts and turn from our sins, turn away from them, and put our trust in what Jesus has done for us when he died in our place, and we choose to follow him as the king of our lives, then that's something amazing happens. All of God comes into all of me. And Jesus restores me back to God's perfect design where I can live now as a brand new creation. Folks, that's the good news of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're living in brokenness today, I want you to know that you can be rescued right where you sit. You see, notice that Jesus didn't lead Zacchaeus in a sinner's prayer. There was something that happened in Zacchaeus' heart. You can talk with God right where you sit today. If you've never made that commitment to follow Jesus as your king, what matters is the posture of your mind and heart and what follows next. Zacchaeus may not have prayed a sinner's prayer, but I'm telling you the truth. Salvation came to his house today. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. Zacchaeus has been changed by the power of the gospel. And you and I can be too. But how will they call upon him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. In short, folks, all the good news in the world won't help anyone if we don't share it. Dottie understood that. She grew up in a solid Christian family. Her family took her to church every Sunday, and she gave her life to Christ as a little girl. And started growing in her church's youth group. There she got grounded in God's word and learned of the importance of sharing Christ with others. A big change came, however, for her when she moved away to college as a freshman. Her dad, being a medical doctor, influenced her to go into medicine. So she lived in the honors dorm. College was exhilarating and challenging for her all at the same time. There were plenty of her peers around her partying and living a worldly lifestyle. But her faith was anchored in Christ. And she found a strong Bible-believing church away at school, got plugged into a college ministry there, and made Christian friends to help her stand strong in the faith. And one day, she met a guy in her honors dorm. She thought he was kind of cute. He was attracted to her also. They quickly became friends and a little bit more. And as their relationship grew, she began to discern that he did not know Christ. Yet he was not like some of their other peers who had no interest in God. He had come to find the party lifestyle empty. And surrounded by all the other students in their dorm, ironically he felt alone. So when she invited him to her college Bible study, he came. And there, would you believe it, she found students who had substance and peace and a hope that he didn't have. He didn't seem to run from the fact that she read her Bible and believed it. He genuinely seemed to be a seeker, but clearly had no connection with Christ. So she reached out to several of her friends and began to invite them to pray for this young man. And one night, they were supposed to go out on a date. And when he came to her room, she took the opportunity to share Christ with him. And he had more questions, so she invited him to go talk to her college pastor. She set up an appointment, and to her excitement, he went. And that day, that young man invited Christ into his heart. He became a new creation. Dottie knew that seekers are all around us, empty, isolated, and searching for hope. 
She lived with spiritual sensitivity to seekers around her. She identified this student as a person who needed the hope of Christ. She took time to get to know him and listen to him. She built a relationship with him so that she could share Christ with him. And she believed that seekers really can be changed by the power of the gospel because she had been changed too. And I'm so glad that she shared Christ with that young man that day because that young man was me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the good news and the hope of the gospel. We know that you're the reason that we can truly have life. Lord, we're thankful that you know exactly where we are. You call us by name. You're on mission to find us. Lord, today I pray if there be any here or watching online who have not yet surrendered their heart to you, I pray and ask that today, even now, they would turn from their sins, place their faith in you, and follow you as king. Lord, give us a heart and a sensitivity for those around us because where you are, that's where we need to be as well. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and right now, we surrender this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing, and this will be your opportunity to respond. So Ben is going to come and lead us here in a second. I'm going to step over to the side over there, and if you have a spiritual uh, decision or commitment that you'd like to make, or you'd just like me to pray for you or with you, I'd be happy to do that this morning. But uh, wherever you are, whatever you need to do, whatever commitment the Lord may be speaking to you about today, don't walk out of here without making a commitment to obey Jesus and do what he's telling you to do. Amen. Come on, Ben. off our Sunday. This is the first time I've done a closing. <laughs> um, let's all remember the, the message we just learned today about how even if you don't believe at first, sometimes with a little bit of a push, anything is possible with God's help. So let's all bow to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray over us all today as we continue on Sunday and throughout this week that hopefully we may all learn to seek God in our own way. Even if we already know him, may we continue to go down this journey through life and that we just take it in because you never know who's lost out there and who God can help. And I pray this all in your precious heavenly name. Before we close, I'd like to just thank Ms. Reverend and his wife.